Thank you very much, uh, Madam President, and to all the officers of the union. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a sweaty. Uh, and for uh, all the contributions today uh, from both sides and from the floor, I've been very entertained, uh, much better than the Cambridge Union. <clears throat> The more I thought about what I was going to say here tonight, the more Monty Python's dead parrot sketch came to mind. <clears throat> For those that haven't seen it, John Cleese goes into a pet shop having recently bought a Norwegian blue and finds Michael Palin on the other side of the counter playing the shopkeeper. John Cleese points out that the parrot is dead. Michael Palin says, of course it isn't. It's just pining for the fjords. It becomes apparent very, very quickly that the parrot is dead, at which point John Cleese picks up the parrot and slams it against the counter, its stiff body almost disintegrating, and everyone realizes, much like the Tories in the general election, that they are well and truly dead. <laughs> the only reason that this government is still sitting on its perch is that it is nailed there by a broken political system. You might not know this, but uh, I have a guilty secret. And I was part of John Major's campaign team in the 1995 leadership election against John Redwood. And I had su such of the follies and mistakes of youth. And I had the <laughs> mistakes. Thank you. <laughs> and there I had the opportunity of seeing firsthand what a dead parrot government looks like, following a long succession of dead parent governments that have become intellectually dry and run out of ideas, are uh, often corrupt and sleaze-ridden. And tonight, I want to tell you how you can spot a dead parrot government. I'm going to give you five Ds in line with dead parrots. Firstly, they do nothing. A parrot squawks, a government should be governing, but this government does nothing. As we've heard already tonight, an NHS starved of cash that's seen patient experience and staff morale crumble. I'm going to proceed right to the end. I'm not going to take any points. No annual inspections of migrant detention centers, despite the fact that this was brought to the Home Secretary's uh, attention that there was incredible abuse going on right on her watch. No action on overcrowded prisons, as we've heard in the news today. Nothing while schools literally crumble around our young people. No national transport strategy, as has been pointed out this evening. A government paralyzed between huge debt on the one hand and a cost of living crisis on the other, but unable to do anything as if that rigor mortis has well and truly set in. A government on whose watch any pretense of being a leader in climate change has fallen by the wayside, and it isn't good enough to claim credit for what a Labour government did 30 years ago in halving emissions. Impotent as our seas and rivers fill with sewage, doing nothing while coal mines, new oil and gas fields are approved, new licenses for wind power are available but go unused because the government doesn't support them. A dead government where clearly rigor mortis has set in. But the fact that it does nothing leads to our second D, deep fake. As in the Monty Python sketch, when the pet owner shouts to John Cleese, look, it moved, when clearly it didn't. Ministers will try to pretend their government is actually doing something, as we've heard from the opposition tonight. The big pledge to halve inflation. Of course, everyone, even Tory MPs, know that the halving of inflation is down to the Bank of England's interest rate policy and macroeconomic forces. It has very little to do with fiscal policy. <laughs> And that doesn't stop ministers pretending that they are somehow responsible for this falling inflation. This deep fake approach was perhaps exemplified by the Prime Minister, as we've heard from Vince Array tonight a few weeks ago, when he announced a series of green measures he was going to scrap. A meat tax, seven bins for every household, compulsory car sharing, taxes on flying, they were all going to go. He was even going to get rid of the requirement to stay within 15 minutes of your home. The only problem is that none of these things ever existed in the first place. Complete nonsense, silliness, as Savince eloquently put it. 
This is deep fake policy from a deep fake government. But if deep fake doesn't work, there's always the art of distraction, as we've heard tonight, the third D. As in the dead parrot sketch, when John Cleese points to the fact that the parrot is not actually doing anything, the pet shop owner seeks to divert attention elsewhere. Likewise, ministers will distract, distract and blame anyone and everyone else. They might even refer to the Green Party in Germany, as it has anything to do with the Green Party in this country. Remember Foreign Secretary James, remember Foreign Secretary James cleverly trying to blame Labour for the fallout from Liz Truss's budget. In fact, barely a week goes by now without another cabinet minister trying to blame their opposite number, writing a letter to them, urging them to clarify their position on the cost of living crisis or just stop oil, as if they are the ones that need to be held, held to account, not the government. This is nothing more than the government seeking to distract from its own inadequacy. And then, of course, as we've just heard, there is the serial distractor. The Donald Trump Tribute Act, Suella Braverman. Ready to wage a culture war against anything and everything. Lefty lawyers, the Brexit-loving BBC, dancing police officers, activist civil servants, politically correct scientists, a virtue signaling elite. Criminal human rights laws. We've heard about the Guardian reading tofu eaters. Fire engine blocking protesters, and at the same time, the fire service itself. As far as the Home Secretary, I'm not going to take any points of information now. As far as the Home Secretary is concerned, anything and everything gets the blame as she tries to distract from her own inaction. The penultimate D is decay. You can tell a dead parrot government by the stench of sleaze and scandal that emanates from it. In the final years of the major government, it was cash for questions. For this government, it is cash for just about anything. A year ago, Rishi Sunak stood on the steps of Downing Street and promised a government with integrity, professionalism, and accountability. A few months later, he refused to release details of his private jet use at taxpayers' expense. Michael Gove has refused to close a loophole in party funding that has allowed the Tories to rake in more than 8.7 million from secretive donors. Nadim Zahawi, the Tory party chair, sacked over his tax affairs. Scott Benton, suspended after appearing to offer to lobby for gambling investors. And now we know, as we've already heard tonight, about the raft of crony contracts handed out during the COVID pandemic, enriching government ministers, MPs, their friends and families. The stench of decay hangs in the air. Realizing the argument is lost, the shop owner accepts the parrot is dead. John Cleese leaves the shop and he goes to get a new one. You know a government has shuffled off this mortal coil when everyone is abandoning it. And I don't just mean the Tories in red wall seats who lent their votes to the Conservatives at the last election. I don't just mean the working class voters who have realized whose side this government is really on. Business leaders are shifting their allegiance. Even Tory members are deserting the party. The recent Tory party conference was so empty it looked as even the auto queue was going to leave. We are debating whether this House has confidence in the government when even its own parliamentary party does not have confidence in it. Crushing defeat hangs over Tory MPs and it's got them running for the doors. Not just Matt Hancock, officer, I'm a celebrity. More than 50 others have said that they will be stepping down at the next election. If the announcements continue at this rate, it will be 100 MPs quitting by the time of the next general election but it's already more than at any time since, La since Labour's 1997 win. And around half those MPs are at the start of their political careers in their 30s and 40s, deserting their dead government. So I'll end with Monty Python. I know a dead parrot when I see one, and we are looking at one now. It's passed on, it is no more, it has ceased to be, it has expired and gone to meet its maker. It's a stiff, 
bereft of life. It's off the twig, it's kicked the bucket, it's shuffled off this mortal coil, it's run down the curtain and joined the quiet invisible. It is an ex-government and this House should have no confidence in it. Thank you.